So welcome, everyone. Welcome to the Kunstalevin. Um, this will be the first talk of the last day of L'Exposition Imaginaire. And um, we, I'm going to present a contribution by uh, Raimundas Malasauskas, who cannot be here physically but he sent um, a contribution that I will then explain. And um, Raimundas is, um, is a Lithuanian curator and, and writer. And um, he worked for more than 10 years, from 1995 to 2006, at the Contemporary Art Center in Vilnius, where, among many other projects, he also produced um, uh, weekly uh, TV show, CAC TV, which was um, a, an experimental merger of commercial television and contemporary art that run under the slogan, every program is a pilot, every program is the final episode. Um, he curated uh, numerous exhibitions, including the Nine Baltic Triennial in Vilnius, he, he was visiting curator at the California College of Arts in San Francisco in, from 2007-2008. Um, he collaborated with the artist Lori Greo, co-producing the co-writing the libretto of Cellar Door, which was an exhibition as an opera that Lori uh, organized at the Palais de Tokyo. And um, he, um, he developed uh, as well two ongoing projects, and one is the hypnotic show, and the second one is the Clifford Irving show. Um, in 2012, he was part of the curatorial team of Documenta uh, 13, directed by Karolin Christoph Bakargiev, and uh, the year after, in 2013, he curated um, the pavilion of uh, Lithuanian and Cyprus at the Venice Biennale in this wonderful um, location was a gymnasium and um, is, um, he also published a book recently called uh, paper, titled Paper Exhibition and is now um, one of the curators of the Liverpool Biennial which is going to open um, on the 7th of July. Um, so, uh, Raimundas um, decided to contribute to l'Exposition Imaginaire, um, sending a contribution which is, um, which is an artwork to be experienced uh, under hypnosis. And uh, so it's part of this uh, project called a Hypnotic Show that I mentioned before, which is uh, an exhibition which happen in your brain. And uh, he developed it with um, an artist and um, hypnotist called Marcus Lutians, who is based in, in LA. And they first uh, uh, present this exhibition in San Francisco in 2008. And then he had different uh, iterations, including in Documenta, where um, where they perform at least more than 300 sessions. And um, so it's, um, it's an ongoing project, as I said, and uh, basically um, Raimundas um, commissioned to many artists a work which um, basically is a, is, a, is a script, is like a score, which um, uh, with the help of, of Marcus is, uh, as, is is going to be experienced by uh, by the audience, and um, he did uh, um, also um, during the um, uh, one of these um, presentation was happening in Torino during an art fair. Artisa in that case. Um, artists uh, wrote scripts uh, about um, exhibitions to be experienced, like exhibitions that happened in the past, such 
I don't know, information or other exhibition. And, um, and of course, um, uh, this specific project, the hypnotic show, has to do uh, with many of the issues also that L'Exposition Imaginaire is dealing with. So the physicality of the, of the artworks, the experience we can have of the artworks, the dematerialization of, of the piece, what an exhibition can be. And uh, so the potentiality of, of, the, of an, the exhibition format. So for Raimundes, um, he, um, he defined this, um, this exhibition as a temporary social structure for engaging into creative cognitive acts through shared practices of art and hypnosis. And um, it was also published, this book by Stamber Press, uh, written by Marcos Lutyens, his Memoirs of a Hypnotist. And um, I want to just to read you briefly um, uh, in the words of Raimundas, uh, the hypnotic show, what, what led him to, to then conceive this, this exhibition. And um, he, so Raimundas wrote that, I often used to think of the exhibition as a public vehicle that was making more of art than art itself and those organizing social forms of being together predicated on thinking, sensing, experiencing. How great it sounds, no? Why should it be then possible to curate an exhibition that, one, occurs in the mind of the audience without being a representation of anything identical to it? Two, fully abolishes the physical parameters and properties of object wood. Three, emerges as a non-referential cerebral dream Four, performs a sensorial and intellectual transfers act like what is happening in the man who taught black Blake paintings in his dreams, the drawing by William Blake. Five, pushes dematerialization to the limit that sci-fi, faith, and neuroscience can only imagine. Six, stays miniature, telepathic, autonomous, and easily transferable. Seven reformulates all the above statement in its making. Um, so now I will ask you to just to relax and uh, to listen to to this audio audio file. So yeah, you can close your eyes, relax, feel free. I am your guide tonight. I am an ancient worm who has been around in recycled forms for many thousands of years. Being composed of mostly earth, I do not die. I merely shrivel into a skin encasement and go dormant, waiting for history to pass. Upon the first spring rain I reproduce myself as a princess through my clitella, which rings my tubular body like the foreskin of Jesus on the fingers of ecstatic nuns, turned around and round in prayer. Round and round you are turning in circles and with each turn you are going down. The mud is mercury and fills your pores with its poison. The tips of your body twitch unconsciously at the sensuous quality of its wet, soft surface lapping at your sides. It is like the tarantella the abstraction of a body jerked along by spider venom, but softer, more writhing, more slow.
Your desiccated body is turning plump as it hydrates in the mud, coming alive like a tire lifting its tired rubber head from the road. The mud slows your descent slower, slower, slower as you go deeper until time has stretched and three generations of Sicilians exist within the plane of a fossil. What looks like a trilobite from an aerial view is actually the first Sicilian and inside his left thigh you see a tiny picture of his son, also known as the farmer's daughter who existed before the evaporation of the Nile. And in her straw hat, in the brim of her straw hat, are the offspring, which take form as a flock of mosquitoes, as a flock of mosquitoes. You are swept up on the back of the last mosquito. You are sweeping over the landscape and the very sight of the desert and its reflective salt is so dry you turn away in horror and feel the collapse of one of your four hearts and then the second one goes off with a hollow pop. Luckily your carrier lands on the sparsely haired expanse of a pinkish mammal and you slip over the mosquito's neck, sliding down her tongue like a shimmering slide, like a hollow metal needle propelling you into this soldier's blood, and the hot, fast river pulls you along, and you're helpless. Your wetness fills you with relief. You take out a tiny wooden ruler from your pocket and you examine it closely. As you examine it, it grows to its proper length. Even though the river of blood you're in is coursing along quickly. Time has no relevance and you feel you're floating weightlessly without speed. Carefully looking at each centimeter marked in black on this wooden ruler, you dip your ruler into the pool of blood, and each mark will take you back a year, a decade, a century, a year, a decade, a century. The tunnels of the soldier's veins are glittering and dark like a cave made out of obsidian. You are floating down this obsidian cave into another year. Another decade, another century, where the labyrinth opens up into an airy room. You take a long look around the room, noting its furnishings its fullness or its emptiness, its objects, textures, sounds, smells. And perhaps you see symbols and markings carved into the wall of the room. You lean closer to try and read them. And as you do, you notice the wall trembling. You look up and notice the rock ceiling of the cave is filling with fine cracks and disintegrating. It's falling upon you in a fine shower of stone, but there is no fear, there is no sharp pain. Instead, the stones feel like the patter of kitten paws running along your body, and the burial can that they create on top of your body is like a warm embrace of snow. The confusion of the couch you misremember as your lover, as your lover. Someone comes along long after the stillness, after the rain of rocks is over and the cave no longer exists. You hear them approach from a long echoing distance away. Each footstep is the passage of several hundred years. 
And when a long time has passed, someone comes and lifts the plush electric blanket from your face and the crisp night air fills your lungs. They're peering at you in wonder as if they have never seen a being or an object quite as strange and marvelous as yourself. They lean in close to gather every detail of your visage, and the panting humidity of their warm, dank breath sloughs off layers of your skin. A finger falls off gently, and later when the cocoon around you is jostled accidentally, the whole of your lower arm follows with a soft, crumbling crash. And these pieces are scooped up and packaged in the newspaper. You catch a glimpse of the year printed on it. Your flesh is sold as a color, mummy brown. A beautiful color, the texture and density of mud, you travel in paint boxes to European countries where dandies bury you in mock funerals, returning you to the ground where you take centuries to burrow back to Cairo. In the city, your brownness backgrounds the pale forms that come out to, to dance in the rain, and their wriggling moves the dirt around in wild patterns leaving marks and smears like writing, writing that can never be deciphered, incantations and spurious spells without translation, painted briefly upon this pavement, painted briefly. So this, uh, this was a script written by the artist Candice Lim, and the voice was the one of Marcos Luchens. Thank you.